for this year's uh, edition will be serving up a buffet of programs, uh, displays and activities related to culinary tradition. As Batik Simbot. So Batik Simbot is a type of resist dyeing, just like Batik but instead of using wax, it's a prototype of Batik. So it's using rice paste. So it's a mixture of rice paste as well as uh, gula melaka or any form of sugar or jaggery. As you can see over here what he's doing. So it's a resist technique so it resists the incoming dyes to produce the pattern. So the rice paste itself covers the, the cloth so that when it comes into contact with the dyes, the areas that are covered will remain the original colour which is white that you can see over here or the areas that are exposed will absorb the dyes. The dyes that we have are also natural dyes so it comes from three different plants. So if you can make a guess like where you think like the colours are, maybe uh, maybe you ma'am, can you guess? Like okay, we make a guess like the yellow where they, you think it comes from from the three different the plants that we have up here, which you think the yellow comes from? Is No, there isn't turmeric. Yeah, yeah. There isn't turmeric, but yes, turmeric is definitely a known uh, dye or dye sauce for yellow. But there's also another dye sauce that you may not be aware of. Can you guess which of it over here? Or kids, do you know where? Uh, which? Mango. Mango, yeah, you're right. So this is the mango leaf over here. So you can get uh, the yellow dye from mango leaves. Um, the red is from anato or achuete. So it's a common dye, uh, it's a food dye that is used in the Philippines. Uh, and it's also known as a lip balm tree because you can use it as lipstick. Uh, and then this one over here, there's an unassuming plant. Someone actually mistaken it for uh, Indian drum stick, but it's actually indigo. So this is your indigo tinctoria, which is your uh, uh, tropical indigo. So it looks green, but if you crush it and it oxidizes, it becomes blue. And that's how you get the different colors over here. And even the patterns that we have are specially curated to reflect food um, heritage. So this one, the rosette or the diamond that you used to have over here is known as a wajik motif, which is your rice cake motif. While this one over here is uh, your bamboo shoot motif, which you also see in textiles like for example, like the Malay brocade, which is Songke. So we'll be also touching, uh, besides creating your own tote bag with Batik Simbot, we'll be also going on a tour to look at the interactions between India and Southeast Asia, specifically the Malay archipelago, and how these interact in terms of the motives and also of the techniques between India and also Southeast Asia. Yeah, so those are some of the things that you'll find out. Uh, if you join our program next week, uh, over the next weekend, we'll be doing this, conducting this over the weekend on Saturday and Sunday. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, Rashida from Sherry's Baby. So, actually, uh, making miniature food, uh, I've loved doing handicraft, so I've been doing it for quite a while. But miniature food making has been with me since about 2014. So, what I really like about it is because I can create food that I like to eat and also to preserve um, the Malay heritage and culture. So, uh, I have here some of the items. Most of the items, the structures are bought online, sourced from online. But the food itself is what I've made. So, I've got sayur lode, sambal goreng, and a gang, which you can actually see the illustrations are behind me. Yeah, so what I will be doing for the workshop next Sunday is actually this uh, clay platter. So if you attend, uh, you'll get to learn how to make it. So I'll just do a quick demonstration here. So what I use is actually polymer clay. Um, typically, there are about two big, I, I think two broad categories of clay. Like, so the first one is um, oven baked and air dry. So the one that I use is oven baked so that I actually can uh, take my time to craft it and do the details. So uh, it's a bit small. So, uh, Zoom or come closer. So I'm going to just demonstrate how I make the clay matmor. The clay matmor is just the biscuit, uh, mostly crumbly, and then inside is crushed peanuts and dusted with powdered sugar or icing sugar. So it's a bit not very nice here. So the matmor is typically like leaf shaped with some grooves. So something like this. And then after that, I use like fig sugar to adjust it. So this is my more. And if I have time, I'll just show a little part. Wow. So I think I'm, most of you are very familiar with this. So I don't need to uh, introduce it. So what I do is just shift it first. Then I use this ball tool to just make it indent in the center. 
then using the needle too. Just make it loose like so. <laughs> it's a bit rough. Like, do I color the cream myself? Actually, I just buy pre buy the colors. Um, some of the brands they do carry colors, but let's say I need some certain colors like this for a particular shade of yellow, I'll just mix um, different colors like yellow, white, and translucently to get the effect. Hi, everyone. Hi, my name is Ali. Uh, I'm uh, from Tariq. We are located at 92 Arab Street. We're just opposite the, uh, the mosque. We are mainly specialized in tea, I would say. Uh, we do different kind of variation of tea. We have the ginger tea, we have the pandan tea, we have the spice tea as well, which we call te karak. And we also have the saffron tea, our best seller. So our tea dust and our uh, spices comes from all over the world. We choose the best material, uh, the best uh, spices. Our saffron, we uh, we bring in from Iran because I think Iran has uh, the best saffron. But mainly saffron you can get from different different countries like Spain, uh, Afghanistan, and also India. But I especially choose from Iran. Uh, the difference how we brew our tea and from other places is we try to do it the traditional way, which is uh, we have a pot of uh, we have a pot and then we brew it all the ingredients together so that means we put our tea dust our spices our milk uh, together so we can get the the, the the full the full flavor but uh, some of other other places they they do it differently uh, they have like a boiler machine in that boiler they have uh, tea hot water coffee and also ginger so they just take uh, a bit a bit a bit and then they just mix the uh, milk and then they just serve to the customer for me uh, i i want to do it differently uh, i feel that's the best way to enjoy uh, enjoy your tea and also we are known as tarik te tarik tarik in malay means pool so we i will i will demonstrate to you the the pulling of the tea so there's a different uh, reason why we uh, we pull the tea uh, Mainly because when we brew the tea, it's piping hot. So when we want to serve to our customer, we want to have that temperature. And also to mix uh, the ingredients together. Some of them, they stir uh, some of the cocktail, uh, uh, you know, they shake and all. But in Te Tari, how they mix it, they tarik the tea. Okay, so now I just need a, a bit of space to do the tarik. Uh, and it will just do the tarik. In the workshop uh, next week, uh, the participants can actually do the tarik themselves, and they can also brew the tea themselves. I will bring the the pot and the pans, and you know they can they can do it. Uh, they can have a hands on actually. Okay. Okay, I'll just serve some of you guys some tea. Put it here and just please help yourself with the tea. Hi everybody, my name is Azatifa. So I'm a self taught henna artist since I was since I was 12 years old, and I've been doing it professionally since I was 16. So primarily the services that I provide are bridal henna services, corporate workshops, as well as mixing my own products to sell them online. So let's begin with the henna powder. So in order to make your henna cones, this is what you normally see on the in the shop that on the rack. But however, there's a very tedious process uh, when it comes to making henna cones. So first, of, the, of course, you need your henna powder and you will need other natural ingredients like sugar, essential oils and water. So each of these ingredients have their own significant purpose. 
So for example, the essential oils that we use is pure 100% essential oils. So what it does, not only to add uh, more fragrance to the henna cones, but to also bring out the stain from the henna powder. Oh. Yeah, and the sugar that's found in the henna powder is so that it allows the henna to stick onto your skin without letting it fall off easily. And the water is so that it can have a more textured paste. So when it comes out, it's really stringy. So I'll show an example. So this is how you can get the cons good consistency of a henna paste. And I'll also show you guys how you can roll your henna cones. So this is the first step when you're going to make your henna paste. So first, you begin like this. You will roll the cone. And when it reaches to the tip, you will grab a pin. This is a really tiny pin. The smaller it is, the more intricate the designs can be. So this is what I prefer as a henna artist. So once you have that, I like to use my tape dispenser. It's really convenient. You just have to pull it up and it just dispenses out the tape for you. And then what you will get is this cone shape. And then after you can put the henna inside and pack it properly and then it will look something like this. Okay. So now I'll be doing a demonstration on how I will draw the henna design. So these are some motifs that you can expect um, in the, at the booth on 27 and 28 of April. So it's mainly influenced by floral motifs or leaves, um, basically nature inspired. So I'll have Ardini here as my model. So I will draw a design for her. So henna is a really uh, famous uh, art, sometimes during Ramadan, Deepavali, or even um, wedding festivities. I never realized they had essential oils and sugar. Oh yeah, definitely. Or if it's a natural henna cone, definitely there will be essential oils in it. Um, I think some people can confuse natural henna with instant henna. So typically instant henna, once you apply it onto the skin, a colour develops almost instantly and it only lasts perhaps one to three days. Whereas for natural henna, it can last for one, one to two weeks uh, provided you take care of the henna properly. So there are many ways that you can take care of the henna so that um, it can stay for that long. So firstly, upon application, you have to leave it on for six to eight hours. So this might sound um, really scary and daunting to be on for very long without like pinching, but um, uh, good things take time. <laughs> so after you leave it, uh, after you leave it on for six to eight hours, you have to remove the henna, but without water. So what the water does, it might actually affect the oxidation process of um, the henna stain. So it's best to avoid water in the first twenty four hours upon application. After which. You need to keep your body warm when you apply the henna, uh, henna design. This is so that it allows the stain to become darker and um, throughout the first 48 hours, you need to avoid water as much as possible. So it's good to apply like a balm so that it helps to repel the water and stop it from affecting the henna stain. so that um, they can heal from their illnesses. And also if um, uh, they face any hair problems such as dandruff or hair fall, it would be good to apply henna throughout the scalp and leave it on for a few hours before removing it. Uh, this practice is um, even up to now, it's still done. And typically, a 
upon removal, the henna stain will turn out somewhat orange, and over time it develops into a dark brown stain. Dear visitors, the sample will be closing in five minutes time. Please remember to collect your belongings from the Thank you, Captain Vivian. Thank you, Captain Vivian. Thank you, Captain Vivian. Thank you, Captain Vivian. Thank you. Thank you.